guys see my screen? <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about nomenclature today. And we're also going to be check, doing chapter 12. So we're also going to talk about types of bonds, sign of things. Okay. So uh, first off, the chemical formula, right? So you guys at this point, you're very familiar with the chemical formula. Now there are, as you guys can remember, we have our symbol, which is typically those one letter or two letters. And then we have the subscript, which tells us the quantity, right? And, and then we have what we call our name. Now we have in the case of H2O, that's water. That's gonna be a common name, right? So you guys should be familiar with two types of common names. So you should be familiar with water and you should also be familiar with ammonia. At least at this point. So we have also talked about different types of bonds. So if we have two nonmetals together, these guys are going to form what we call a covalent bond. So two nonmetals, just say two or more nonmetals. That's going to be a covalent bond. Now, if we have a metal and a non metal, that's going to be an ionic. Okay, questions? Is everybody? The whole water is the same thing. That's what I was asking. Have you all gone or something? I know one had emailed me a paper stick, but traffic. Traffic, yeah, it'll be traffic. Okay. <clears throat> so we've already talked about the diatomic elements. Do you guys remember the diatomic elements? Di meaning two, atomic atom. Anyone? Anyone? I gave you a nice way of remembering it. So, have no fear of ice cold beer. That's right. So have no fear of ice cold beer. Half hydrogen, no. Nitrogen, fear, chlorine, of oxygen, ice, iodine, cold, chlorine, and beer, bromine. Now these are normally when they're by themselves, only when they're by themselves are going to be diatomic. Okay, now I'm going to add one more diatomic. It's going to be a diatomic ion. When we have mercury one, you always write it as Hg two two plus, meaning that each of the mercury have a plus one molecule. And this is mercury one, so this is the mercury one ion. So anytime that we talk about the mercury one ion, we know that it's going to be diatomic. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so this is just showing you where the diatomics are located. Of course, it's basically seven, so you know that you have seven atoms that are the diatomic, okay. except we also have the diatomic pi. Okay, so write the chemical formulas for chlorine, argon, bromine, and krypton. Okay, so what would be the chemical formula for chlorine as a chlorine gas? I'm all you guys yelled once. Capital C. That's right. Okay. Argon. AR. AR. Bromine. Yes. Uh, bromine. Sorry. Krypton. Okay. Big scale, right? <laughs> okay, so you guys have been familiar with the metalloids, with metals, non-metals, and metalloids. Metalloids are going to have characteristics of both metals and non-metals. So depending on where they're located in the name, they're going to act as a metal or a non-metal. Okay. So let me give you an example. So in this case, since the, the arsenic is in the front, it's going to act as a metal. And so since it's going to act as a metal, it's going to act like it's a transitional metal. Transitional metals, they have to be uh, dictated by who they're pairing up with. Right. So if you guys do me a favor, you have your periodic table packet. You guys go to page five. I think it's page five. You see a table. It's called the polyatomic ion table. So what I want you guys to do is to identify uh, the polyatomic ion that looks like this. That's PO4. If you can tell me the charge that's going to be associated with it. Three minus. Three minus. Okay. So this here is what we call a polyatomic ion. And what it is, it's just an ion that's covalently bonded together. So they're all non-metals, right? They're bonded together. And they have the charge that's given there. 
Now, occasionally you will have a case where you have a metal that's going to be attached to it, um, like chromate. Okay. So that's going to be sort of an exception. Okay. Now, this polyatomic ion altogether has a charge of minus three. So if I have this guy, which is PO4, and we have two of those, each one of those have a negative three charge. So what is going to be the charge on the, the arsenic? Now, I didn't say this, but I'll say it now. The sum of the total compound has to add up to zero. So your positive and your negatives have to cancel out. So if that's the case, each one of these POs have a minus three charge. And we have two of those, sorry, PO4s. We have two of those. So that's the total charge of what? Okay, so it's gonna be six minus. Okay, so how many positive charge will I need to balance that out? I'm gonna need six, right? So I only have one arsenic, so that arsenic has to be six plus. So in this case, just for this particular situation, arsenic, its name would be arsenic. We use Roman numerals. six, and then we use phosphate, okay? Now, this is a case where we have, like I said, a metalloid. A metalloid can go both ways. Acts like a metal sometimes, and sometimes it acts like a non -metal. Okay, are you guys with me so far? Okay, so let me give you an example where it's gonna act like a non-metal. So now, since we have arsenic in the back, arsenic is going to act like a non-metal. And so in this case, you're going to try to be like a noble gas. Arsenic is going to try to be like a noble gas. How far is it away from being a noble gas? Based upon our periodic table. Periodic table. Okay, arsenic is right here. The nearest noble gas is krypton. So that's one, two, three. So if we add three electrons, it's gonna be like krypton. So the charge on arsenic is gonna be three minus, that's right. So in this case, arsenic is gonna be three minus. Okay, so this compound that we have now is gonna be called sodium arsenide, okay? So when it acts like a minus, we put IDE at the end of it. It also tells us two things. It tells us we're at the end of the compound and also that it's the anion. And we have our cation and our anion coming together, okay? Questions? Any questions? What okay. slide are we on? Slide, I don't know. The one that has metal voice. 10. I just go through them. I don't care. <laughs> so, 
So when we talk about bonding, we have covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is when we're sharing electrons. So if we take a look at hydrogen, hydrogen has one valence electron, right? So that's why we draw H with one dot. And then, so if we have two hydrogens that are coming together, for it to be like helium, it needs to have two electrons. And hydrogen is a special case. It's only gonna to wanna to have the maximum of two electrons around it, okay? Because then it's just like helium. Because we know that helium is the noble gas in that very first period. And it only has how many electrons? It has two. And so hydrogen is going to want to be like you and have two electrons. Okay. So if it's covalently bonding, sharing electrons, it's going to make sure that it has two. It's going to share so that it ends up having two electrons around it. So as you can see here, this is one hydrogen, this is another hydrogen, they're gonna be added together, and then they're gonna form the molecule or the uh, diatomic element hydrogen gets. The way that we represent a bond or them sharing is by putting a line, okay? So that reminds us that they're sharing the electron, okay? So when we count it, we count that line as two electrons. And the goal is, for the atom by itself acting like it's a noble gas. So it reaches its, what we call, in most cases, it's octet, but in this case, this one is just gonna have two instead of eight, right? So if we take a look at this hydrogen, it has two around it. And if we take a look at at this hydrogen, it has two around it, okay? So both of them have reached their both octet. They're like a noble gas, they're stable, okay? So when we have two or more atoms coming together, right? Two or more different atoms, so two or more atoms coming together in general, it's a molecule. Two or more different atoms are gonna be called a compound, okay? So in the case of H2O, We know that hydrogen has how many valence electrons? Hydrogen has two valence electrons? It has one, right? And we know that we have two hydrogens. So each one of them have a valence electron. Okay, oxygen. Oxygen has how many valence electrons? Not eight. Two. No, nope, not two. Six. It has six. So if we go to our periodic table, we know the valence electrons will be the, the ones in that outer shell. So let's go to our periodic table first. So we're looking at this outer shell here. And what we're gonna do is just gonna count just the S and the P. Where's the S located at? Which groups cover the S or, or subshell? Sub one. And? You said alkaline and which other group? So the second group and what other group? alkaline the first group. so the first and second group represents the s right so where's the p represented at anyone oh wait somebody said it in the starts with the boron starts with the boron so group which group is that 13 to 18 right so we know that 13 to 18 is representing the P. Don't forget that, because it definitely will be on a test, right? 
Okay, so then all we do, we want to count the S and the P's, right? Till we get to our element. So if you count across, that's one, that's two, that's three, here's four, five, and six. So oxygen has six valence electrons, okay? So it has six dots. So if we take a look at our hydrogen, first off, I'm showing you how to draw a Lewis dot structure. Now, hydrogen is going to want to have two electrons around. So it's going to take one of the electrons from oxygen and share it. And then it's going to, the other hydrogen is going to do exactly the same. So if we count the number of electrons, that's two, four, six, eight around oxygen, okay? Now, if there's eight around it, it's gonna be like neon. It's gonna be stable, right? Because it needs two electrons. Doesn't it need two electrons to become like neon? Oxygen's right here. We add two more, want to be like neon? Okay? So if there's two more electrons, it's gonna be like neon. So if it's a non-metal, it's gonna to wanna to share. If it's a metal, it's gonna to wanna to take it, okay? It shares with the people that are close to it, the non-metals. So non-metals will share, forming a covalent bond. And then metals and non-metals will form what we call an ionic bond, right? Okay, so it reaches its octet, it's stable. Hydrogen only wants two around it, right? It wants to be like helium. So that means it has two electrons around it. So this line represents two electrons, okay? Now the key is, is that hydrogen can never be in the middle because it can only have two electrons around it. If you put it in the middle, it's gonna have more than two electrons. Around it. Does that make sense? Yeah, no. Don't worry about it. You're going to need a lot more stuff practice. Just start throwing stuff in. You're going to see what six first, okay? We're just throwing right now. Okay? Here's a question. Okay. Okay. So the thing about non-metals, non-metals, they're not good at, I mean, not metals, non, yeah, non-metals, non-metals or compounds or covalent compounds, they're going to be really bad at conducting electricity. In most cases, they do not conduct electricity. Where ionic compounds, when you put them in water, they're going to be able to conduct electricity. But if we don't put them in water, they won't conduct electricity. So, Ionic compounds can conduct electricity when they're put in water. Covalently bonded compounds don't conduct electricity. We'll do a little test here in a second. So you guys can see that. Okay. Can you guys do me a favor? Can you give me the batteries? You know, you know this one. Okay. Now covalent bonds, really what's happening is when I say they're sharing. What's really happening is that their electron clouds are overlapping. And so they're overlapping orbitals. So they are going to be sharing, circling around both atoms. So in the case of water, you're going to have one of those electrons that are between hydrogen and oxygen. It's going to be circling around both of the atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. And that, that same thing is going to be happening on the other side. I'll show you a picture of this. A picture of this in a second. Okay. So here, this is just showing us hydrogen and hydrogen. So this is them independently, right? But when they're together, this electron is gonna be circling around both of them, okay? This electron is gonna be circling around both of them. So it's gonna be sharing that space, okay? So they're literally shared in that sense. They're sharing the same thing, okay? 
Okay, so Lewis stock structures, the way that we do a Lewis stock structures is that we count the number of valence electrons and then you put those dots around. Them. So if you guys can do me a favor, how many valence electrons does fluorine have? Seven. That's seven. Okay. So since it has seven, I put seven dots around it. So if I'm making fluorine ga gas, which we know is a diatomic, each of the fluorine atoms have seven electrons. They want to get to the point where they have eight and be like neon. So how many electrons must be shared between each one of them? How many more electrons will fluorine need to be like neon? One, that's right. So they're gonna share one so that it could be like neon. Okay, so in this case, they're gonna be sharing that one. And so we're gonna draw a line between the two to represent a bond. And this is called a single bond, okay? Because it's a single line. And they're only sharing two electrons between the two. If I have four electrons being shared, it's gonna form a double bond. So if you guys can do me a favor, we're going to have you do the same thing that we just did for fluorine for oxygen. Because we know that oxygen is also a diatomic. O2. So if we're making O2, show me how that's going to work. So that they both have eight around. There should be some in there. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, Okay, what do you guys think? How many valence electrons does oxygen have? Each oxygen? Seven. Are you sure? Can we repeat our table with you? Six. Okay, I want you to count. Six. 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 It has six valence electrons. You guys should have waited a minute because I was going to bet him a dollar. I have a dollar here waiting for you. I believe it's yours. I got a dollar too, so that works. I don't steal. I mean, I like it's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, I believe you handed it to me. Exactly. Okay, so how can I move these electrons around? So the first thing that I'm going to say is the best way of doing it is by counting all of the electrons that we're working. So each of them have six. That's a total of how many valence electrons? Twelve. So we have 12 valence electrons. So we have 12 valence electrons to work with because we know that electrons are mobile. They're going to be constantly moving, right? So since they're mobile, they can move any way that they need to move to sit there and make it work so that they're sharing appropriately. So how can I set this up so that I, I am sharing so that I have eight electrons around each of the different oxygens? Put the two electrons in the middle. Okay, so you're just, just two. So we'll do that. We'll take these two and we'll put those in the middle. Okay, so let's count. That's two, that's four, that's six around this oxygen. So does that work out? But if we look on the other side, that's two, that's four, that's six, that's eight. So that works out for that side, but not for the other. So what else can I do? Take other two and make another bond. I'll take two from over here. Right. Okay, and I'll put that in the middle. Okay, so then that's two, that's four, that's six, that's eight. That works out for this oxygen. That's two, that's four, that's six, that's eight. That works out for that oxygen. So both sides are happy. Okay. 
So this is an example of a double bond. So this is a single bond. You're looking for the little ones? No. They should be up at the top. Yes. The very, the very, very top? No. In that box, yeah, check that box. And this is a double. Pretty simple so far. Okay, let's do it for nitrogen. Into. Your favorite get salt and sugar, and we're going to need still water. What was that? Yeah, it's a nice. What was that? The they're in the bags with the something. But not close to us, but with the. Okay. How many valence electrons do we have for nitrogen? Five. Five. Okay, so we have five. So each of the nitrogens will have five valence electrons. One, two, three, four. Okay. One, two, three. Okay, so how can I arrange them so that everybody has eight for that? Do the same that we did for the oxygen. Okay, so you're saying put two. So we're gonna take these two, that'll be one. And then let's say this one here, we're gonna move that over here. So okay, see you down. Put another one in between. Okay, so if we count, that's two, that's four, that's oh sorry, two, four, six. So that's six around there. So is that eight? Is that gonna work? No, it's not gonna work for that one. Okay, so what else do we need here? What else can we do? Take another set, just like we did earlier. So if we take the two from here and bring those over. Four, six, eight. So that's eight around that nitrogen. That's two, four, six, eight. That's eight around this nitrogen. So this is called a triple bond. That's right. Now, a triple bond is the maximum 
bonds that we're going to have between two atoms. We can't have a quadruple bond, okay? So a triple bond is it because it's too rigid for them to sit there and have a quadruple bond. It would be unstable. It won't work. Okay. So either you're going to have a single bond, a double bond, or a triple bond. Okay. How are you feeling so far? A lot more. Okay. So when we talk about, let's go back to that nitrogen. Minty, I'm going to put you on mute, okay? <laughs> oh, she got it. That's good. Okay. So, in this case, we want to make sure that we're obeying the octet rule, meaning that we have eight electrons around us. The octet rule, okay? The other thing is, is that these guys here, they're called lone pairs. So, electrons aren't going to be individually located. They're going to pair up. They like to pair up. Okay, that pairing up allows them to maintain a sense of stability. Okay, so when we have these guys, these are called your lone pairs. Now, the lone pairs are not going to be involved in bonding, right? They're just for that particular element. They're only going to surround the nitrogen. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, let's do it. There's five groups. Again, okay. Or it doesn't matter either one. Either one yep. But you may want to tell them which one it is because there's you can't tell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is polar and non-polar. How many of you guys have siblings? Okay. So then you guys can probably relate to this. So when I was a kid, my parents used to buy us a gift together. Right? We would get underwear, shirts, like clothes for school and stuff like that. And we would get a gift that we'd have to share. Usually that gift was a nice gift. We weren't real you know, rich. We didn't get our own PlayStation or our own TV. It was things that we had to share. So we got an Atari one day, right? And so my mom says, okay, I got you guys an Atari, so you guys have to share it. And so my parents, during that break, Christmas break and everything like that, they both worked and everything. So actually, my dad was actually both, but my mom was working two jobs, and so she'd come home and go back to another, her other job to that time period. But she said, you guys got to share. So, but the rule was, is that we can only put the Atari at the house screen. So what I would do was, was that I would sit there and I get my sister to do the cleaning of the house and everything like, and then I'd play the guitar, right? And then they couldn't cook. I knew how to cook. I had to cook dinner. So then what I'd do, I'd wait, time it just right, and then uh, I'd start cooking. And then, you know, I'd come out and everything like that, and my mom would walk in as I finish cooking and getting everything on the table. And then she's like, oh, she's just, you've been working all day. The house is nice and clean and everything. Why don't you sit down and play the guitar, right? And then so, and I let my sisters play just right before my mom got there, right? And so it was sharing, right? And so what my mom saw was that me sharing with my sisters, letting them play while I cleaned up the house and everything like that. She didn't know I played the whole day, right? So isn't that sharing? No. Why isn't it sharing? Didn't they get to play? But is it is it even sharing? Like no, exactly for like 10 minutes. Exactly. So it's sharing, it's being shared, but it's not being shared even. Okay. So when we talk about something that's polar, we're gonna have uneven sharing. Okay, we're gonna have uneven sharing of electrons. So in the case of water, we drew that set that that Lewis structure earlier, right? H. Okay. 
In the case of water, the electrons are being shared between hydrogen and oxygen, but oxygen is stronger. It's like the older brother. It's like me, right? I'm the boss of my system. I'm stronger than them. I told them, you guys clean up, right? While I play the Atari, okay? So we're sharing the Atari, but I get it like 90% of the time and they get it 10% of the time. Fair, right? Just, right? Yeah, for me, yeah, okay? So, but it's still sharing, okay? Now that's exactly what happens with some molecules. And when that happens, we form what we call polar molecules. So if we're sharing unevenly, it's called polar, right? If we're sharing evenly, it's called nonpolar. Now, the reason why we call it polar is because we think of it as poles. Like, have you heard of the term bipolar? Okay, what is bipolar? Mean? Okay, so somebody who's bipolar, they go through extreme emotions. They're either really happy for a minute, and then they're really down for a minute. Yeah, I believe me, I know about bipolar. I think a lot of bipolar, but I can tell you some stories, right? <laughs> One minute they love you, the next minute, get out the damn house. You ain't sleeping here, right? So that is an example of what's going to be happening here. So in the case of our molecule, it's going to be bipolar in a sense. It's going to have a partial, and we use the symbol, that means change. Again, it's the delta, but it's the lower delta. It's going to have a partial negative charge associated with it. And then the hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge. Now, the oxygen is going to have a partial negative charge because the electrons are spending more time around the oxygen than they're spending around the hydrogen. Okay? So both of the hydrogens are going to have a partial positive charge. And the oxygen is going to have a partial negative charge. Okay? And again, it's because the electrons are always moving and it's being shared, but it's being shared unevenly. So that it seems like oxygen is sort of negative, not completely negative, not like an ion, but partially negative. Does that make sense? How many of you guys, anybody have kids? Anybody have either a baby daddy or an ex husband? Anybody have that? Yeah? Okay. Is it with, it's with your kid, right? So does your, your baby daddy get the kids some of the time? Yeah. Okay. But then yeah. that makes my point, right? It, it's kind of like sharing with the kid, right? So for instance, my, my ex-girlfriend has a kid. And what it was was that she would get her son. It would be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then Friday, he would go to his dad's. Saturday, he'd be at his dad's. And then Sunday, he would come back, right? So she would get him five days of the week. And her husband would get him two days of the week. Right. Yeah, so is that even sharing of the kid? No. So the kid is just like that electron, right? And so, but who would you say is raising the kid overall? The mom, right? Okay, so that's sort of what we're doing. So the electron is spending more time around the oxygen than it is around the hydrogen. The hydrogen is kind of like that. Dad, dad, it's only getting the kid once or twice a week, right? Yeah, I didn't say that at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, a little more, too much information, right? Yeah. Okay. So, but it's, it's that same concept, okay? And so it's sharing, right? So the kid is having the opportunity to spend with both parents. The electron is having the opportunity to spend with both atoms, but more with the oxygen, okay? And if you know the her kid, you can see why it's negative, right? And it's been more time. Told you not to do that. I told you not to do that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Now, when it's nonpolar, another example. Here we have this is methane. Okay. Now, methane is even shared. It's being shared evenly between carbon and hydrogen. So that means the electron spends one time here, then the next time there, then one time here, and the next time there. So it's just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? So it's being shared evenly. Okay. So this is called a nonpolar. Even sharing is nonpolar. Uneven sharing is polar. Okay. Are you guys with me? 
Okay, this is just basically showing you what I just told you, right? So this here is considered nonpolar. We have the even chair. This here is considered um, polar, right? Because in this case, it's making it bigger because it's spending more time around Y and less time around X. Okay? And then ionic is when you have a complete charge, right? So one is positive and one is negative. They're completely charged, okay? Now, the way that we determine who's going to get the hit most of the time, or the electron most of the time, is, sorry, it's just, it's having that, right? Is by electronegativity. The term electronegativity means that it's the element that wants to have an electron next to it. It has a strong affinity for electron. So it has a high electron affinity. It wants an electron. Okay, so typically you're going to want an electron if you're really close to being a noble gas. So halogens, where are the halogens located? Give me the group. When I say group, I want the group number. Seven. 17. How far are they away from being a noble gas? One. They're one away. So do you think they're going to really want that electron? Yeah, they're going to really want that electron, right? So they're going to have a higher electronegativity than let's say their neighbor. So who's who's next to Flory? Yeah. yeah. Well that's the noble gas next to oh, on the other so oxygen. oxygen. Okay. So oxygen is two away. Now it's going to have a high electronegativity, but it's not going to be as high as fluorine. Fluorine is going to have a higher electronegativity. <laughs> if you guys are go on your periodic table, I mean your uh, packet. Uh, let's see, it's page six, I believe. That should be this. Figure 12, 15. Okay, so this is your electronegativity table. It lets you know who has the highest electronegativity. If you take a look, Fluorine has the highest electronegativity. It really wants an electron. Fluorine is going to be the small, smallest atom, one of the smallest atoms, but it's going to be like a little tiny, a little Napoleon. Okay? It's going to really want that electron. So it's going to do pretty much anything to get it. And so when they're sharing, it's going to pull the electron towards itself more than any other element. So if you have oxygen and fluorine sharing, it's going to pull it towards itself. Oxygen is going to be shit out of luck. You know, it's like, well, you get a little, you get it a little bit at a time. You're not going to get it much, okay? Because it's so strong compared to everybody else. Now, the way that we determine the way uh, the electronegativity is going, who's going to get the electron more or less, is based upon bonding, right? Based upon its uh, electronegativity and its bonding. Okay, so let's say again we have fluorine and oxygen that are going to be bonded. Okay, now if those two are going to be bonding together, so the way you determine who's going to get the electron the majority of the time, whether it's going to be a, an electron, uh, it's going to be covalently shared, uh, a polar covalent bond or a non-polar covalent bond is by the number or, or the difference between electronegativity. So you take the one that has the highest electronegativity. In this case, if you look on that table, what is the electronegativity of fluorine? 4.0. Okay, it's 4.0. So you take the one that has the highest, and then you subtract the one, the other one. Okay? So oxygen has what? 3.3. So then that's going to give us a value of 3.3. So the rule of thumb is if our if our delta en en represents the electronegativity is less than or 
equal to. Less than, sorry, less than 0 0.5. Then it's going to be nonpolar. Okay. If our, our delta EN is greater than or equal to 0 0.5, but less than. Or equal to 1.8, it's going to be polar. And then if our EN, our delta EN is greater than 1.8. It's going to have ionic character. Okay. Okay. So we have zero point six. Is that going to be? Nonpolar, polar, or ionic here? Polar. Oh, polar. Okay. Now do me a favor. Let's say we have a bond between carbon and hydrogen. Bond between carbon and hydrogen. Okay, so what is the which like which one has the highest electronegativity? Carbon. Carbon. Okay, and it's what? Two point six. Two point six. And then hydrogen has two point two. Two point two. Okay, so that's going to equal okay, 0.4. Okay, so is that polar, nonpolar, or ionic character? It's not polar. Okay, pretty simple. Okay, for now. So now, like I said, now. So now here's the secret. Now, when you have elements, you're always going to have, let's say, more than two elements, right? So if you have more than two elements, kind of like what we have with the carbon in the middle, the one that has the weakest electronegativity would be in the middle, unless it's with hydrogen. Hydrogen can never be in the middle, and it puts everybody else in the middle, okay? Again, hydrogen can never be in the middle, okay? Carbon likes to be in the middle. So let's say, for instance, we have CO2. Okay, what I'd like you guys to do is draw the Lewis dot structure for carbon dioxide. Okay. First off, determine who's going to be in the middle. Right? Just confirm it. Okay. So if you have a bond between carbon and hydrogen, I mean oxygen, who's going to be in the middle? C and O.
right? C is going to be in the middle. Okay, and we figured that out by oxygen has 3.4, carbon was 2.6. That equals 0 0.8. So that means it's going to be polar or non-polar? So the bond is going to be polar. Okay. So we're going to be putting carbon in the middle. It has a weaker electronegativity. So always the weak guy goes in the middle. Again, I like to think of my sisters. Until they got to a certain age, I always put them in the middle. Okay? They'd always be on the outside. So nobody else, who wants to sit in the middle? Anybody like sitting in the middle? Yeah. Then when they got stronger than me, then they start putting me in the middle. So. Okay, so we have carbon in the middle. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four. Four. There's four. Okay. So I have four valence electrons. Okay, so then oxygen has how many valence electrons? Set six. I said underneath the breath. Okay, so what can I do to, so that everybody has eight around? Um, take two from carbon. Take two from carbon. Two from carbon, and then take four from oxygen. So a triple bond is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that would be two, four, six, eight around this oxygen, or like two, four, six, eight around this carbon. Are you saying a single bond here? Then, like this. Is that why you're not saying that? No. But that would technically work, yes. Two, four, six, eight, ten. 12, 14, 16. So if we think about it, we have six plus six plus four. That equals 16. Sorry. So then that's two, four, six, eight around this oxygen. That's two, four, six, eight around this carbon. And then that's two, four, six, eight around this oxygen. So yeah, that would be one possible. If we we're just looking at the oxygen. Okay, is there any other way? Take away two from each oxygen. Take away two from each oxygen and then add two bonds in the middle. So if we do like this.
So then that would be two, four, six, eight around this oxygen, two, four, six, eight around this oxygen, two, four, six, eight around the carbon. Okay, that works well too. So for obeying the octet rule, both of those would work. But now in reality, one of them was favored over the other. And that would be this one. I'll explain that to you. Okay, so there's this term called formal charge. Formal charges tells us when we have the possibility of having multiple waves, right? They're gonna exist in nature. Both of these waves, this way is gonna exist in nature, and this way is gonna exist in nature. The one is gonna be favored more so than the other. The way that we determine which one is gonna be favored is by calculating its formal charge. The way that we calculate a formal charge is it's gonna be number of valence electrons. Number of valence electrons minus number of bonds minus lone pair electrons. Now we want the value that's going to give us the closest to a zero value. Zero is like gold. If you're zero, that means you're using no energy. If you're plus one, you're using a little bit of energy. If you're minus one, you're using a little bit. If you're minus two, you're using more energy. If you're minus three, you're using a lot of energy. That's insane. You don't want to do that. Okay? So the way that you determine which one is going to be the most stable, right, of these two, these are called resonance structures in this case. The one that is going to exist more commonly is, is going to be by doing this calculation. So if we did this, we take a look at each of the oxygens down here. Okay, we'll start off with the oxygens. So this oxygen, we have how many valence, elect valence electrons are on oxygen? Six. Six. We have six, and then we go minus. It says the number of bonds. How many bonds do we have between this oxygen and the carbon? Two. And then the number of valence electrons. I mean, uh, lone pair electrons. There's two here, there's two here. So those are lone pairs, okay? So we have a total of how many? Four. Okay, so that adds up to what? Six minus two minus four? Zero. Now we do the same thing over here. It's exactly the same number. So it's also gonna be zero. And then you do the same thing with the carbon. So this is for the oxygens. And then this is for the carbon. Okay, so carbon has how many lone pair? I mean, how many valence electrons? Four, four valence electrons. And then we subtract the number of bonds. How many bonds do we have? Two sides. We have two here and then two here. Four. And then we subtract the number of lone pairs. Are there any lone pairs on carbon? No. no. Okay, so then that equals zero. Zero. Okay, so this is gold, right? Okay, now if we come over here and we take a look at this one, here. since we have two oxygens, each one's going to have to be calculated independently. Okay, so in this case, for this oxygen, first one. This side, how many lone, uh, how many valence electrons do we have for oxygen? Valence electrons, okay. we have six. How many bonds? Three bonds. And how many lone pair electrons?
Okay, six minus three minus two. Okay, one. That took a long time. I mean, take that hard now. Come on. Okay, so we got one there. Okay, so then for our other oxygen, the second one, it's going to be how many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six. Six. How many bonds are between this carbon and this oxygen? One. And then how many lone pair electrons do we have? Six. We have six. Okay. So we have six minus one minus six. Negative one. Okay. So this structure is going to be more stable because everything is zero. This one is going to be less stable because you have one on one side is plus one, on the other, on the other side is minus one. Right? So it's going to be less stable. So this is the one that's going to see the majority. Okay. That's it. So that, again, that's called formal charges. If you guys typically, if I put it on the exam, it's extra credit. Five points. Okay. Oh, damn, there's that table. Okay. So I told you how to use this table so you guys are getting ahead of the game. We've talked about single bonds, double bonds, and triple bonds. We're really ahead of the game. We've talked about how to do real structures. So if you guys don't mind, so we've already done this other show. Let's say you guys, uh, but you need something to stay. Uh, let's say you guys are going to do Oh, sorry, I totally forgot about that. Are you going to try to sell one to a high bidder? You did, you didn't want just one. Right. Yes. And my class tomorrow. Okay. You guys ready? I'm gonna go to the whiteboard. You guys wanna go over here? This. No yawning, it's not allowed. Okay. Who's going to be in the middle? Right. Always going to be the one who has the lowest electronegativity. Who has the lowest electronegativity? So we're going to put an ice cream. How many bins electrons does ice cream have? One. One, two, Three, four, five. Okay. Oxygen on one side, and then have the other nitrogen. Four, five. How many minutes electrons does the uh, oxygen have? Six. Six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. 
two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So we add together, we have five plus five is ten. We have a total of 16 electrons. Okay. How am I going to make this one? Everybody has to eat less. Would you put take two from oxygen and put it next to the nitrogen? Okay, so I can take two from the oxygen. Something like this. Can we do that? I was gonna ask that. Can we do that? Yeah, we can do that. Remember, they're mobile. They can they can go anywhere you want them to go. Okay, so we're gonna put this in the middle. And then we have bottom over here. That work. Yeah. Let's make sure that we have a total of 16 electrons. That's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. Okay. Got enough electrons. Okay. We have 8 around this oxygen. 2, 4, 6, 8. Yes. We have 8 around this nitrogen. 2, 4, 6, 8. Around the middle nitrogen. And then around the end nitrogen. 2, 4, Six, eight. How'd you get the three from? Triple bond? Yeah, triple bond. Because I took one electron that was up here, that long one that was up there. I took the long one that was up here, and I brought them together. Then we had two here, and we had two here. Oh. Okay. So, does that work? Everybody sees it? Okay, so this is one possibility, right? So let's look at its formal charge. Okay, so let's do the oxygen first. Oxygen. So what is the, how do we calculate formal charge again? Okay, so I'm write it up here so that everybody can see. Formal charge equal to what was that? The number of number of valence. Bonds. Bonds. Okay. Minus bonds minus the lone pair of number of lone pair of Okay. Okay, so for oxygen we have how many valence electrons does oxygen have? Six. How many bonds do we have to put the oxygen in the nitrogen? Bonds? Oh, one. One. Okay. How many lone pair do we have? 
Okay, so this is a minus one. Middle nitrogen. Okay, number of valence electrons. Five. Number of bonds. Number of home pairs. Plus four. Okay. So, hydrogen on the end. Number of Davis electrons. Bonds. One, two, three, bonds, right? And then number of home pair electrons. Two. Okay. That's one possible. Yes, we'll have two electrons like in front of nitrogen. Is it just like seven? So, yeah. yeah. So I have two here. Right. Right. That's two. Each one of these lines. Right? Oh, so those are not two dots next to the. It is just. No, that's, that's straight lines. So. Okay. That's what that's what said. So one line represents two electrons. Okay. So what is another way that we can draw this structure? Add another bond that's in oxygen. Okay, so I have a double bond here. Okay. So if we did it this way, oxygen. Six. Okay. Number of bonds. Two. Number of valence electrons. I mean, uh, lone pair electrons. Four. Okay. Nitrogen. Middle. Number of valence electrons, number of bonds, two, four, number of lone pair electrons. Okay. Number of valence electrons, one. Number of bonds, two. Number of home pair, three. Okay, so I can just kind of shift to the side. Is there any other way? Double bond between the oxygen and the nitrogen, and triple bond between the nitrogen and the nitrogen. Yeah. Would you say that, right? Um, would it be th triple bond between the oxygen and the nitrogen? No, triple bond. Okay. 
Number of bonds. Number of pair electrons. Six. Okay. So now when you have a situation like this where you can't get zero on any page, you want to give to ones where you have the lowest difference in other words. So here, this one is a minus two. That's too much energy, right? It's not going to want to be in a situation. So, I prefer not to see. Okay. And then this one, we have the negative on the oxygen. Now, who's more electronegative, oxygen or electron? Who's more electronegative on our? Oxygen, right? So oxygen is going to want to have to make more of a negative charge. So this is going to be the preference. So let's say we prefer this one because oxygen has a negative charge and then the nitrogen has the positive charge. Okay. But again, they're all going to exist, but this one is going to be more prominent. Let's get more off. So why don't you choose the other one? The other one, because the nitrogen has a negative charge. Okay? Nitrogen isn't as electromagnetic as oxygen. Oxygen wants to make sure you can see it. Right? One bunch of the electrons. Okay. 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 Let's take a uh, fifteen-minute break. You guys don't mind. Five break. Five break. <laughs> 15 minutes. Everybody got a got the next chapter. Okay. Now the end doesn't have to stay together. Uh, remember the uh, the nitrogen is going to be in the middle because it has a weaker electronegativity. Okay, oxygen is going to be on the outside. Always, we're going to put the weaker guy in the middle. Okay, does that make sense? You said it goes in the middle because of the electronegativity. That's right. The one okay. that is electronegativity. It's going to go in the middle, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen can never be in the middle.
Ah, do you want me to yeah. go over it? Okay. So I'm trying to get clear so we can clear out the it's been a long day. Uh, okay, so I'll give you the reason why. I'll show you everything, but let's start off with, let's say we have silk. Oh, I tried doing that one, yeah, that wrong. AG, so we're doing electron configuration of silver. Okay, so, I want you guys to help me out. Gold, iron. Okay, so how are we gonna start out? Oh, 
Okay, so this is what we think it's going to be, right? But if there's this rule, when we're in that D or D shell and we have die, we don't like to have die. We like to get it up to 10. So what we're going to do is we're going to steal one. Steal one of those. And then add it to this. So we're going to end up with 5S1. And four D. Okay. Now the reason it does that is the five S. This is the four D. Okay. So these are the orbitals. So these guys are really close together in terms of the energy level. And what it's determined is, is that it'll actually act as if it's putting in the electron in all of those directions, right? While we're across. And then instead of coming back down there, we'll go ahead and fill this up. Because it's better to have these guys completely full and they're paired up, it's lower in energy. So it actually drops this energy level. Then coming back down over here, putting the one. Okay, so that's going to always happen when we think we're going to end up with E9. Or if we end up with E4. Because it does exactly the same thing. It wants to have at least one in each one of these in the case of the D4. So it's going to still. Take away from this guy and bring it over here. Okay. For stability purposes. Okay. So if you think you're going to have an E4 and E9, it's going to steal from that S. And then so that this would be 5. Okay. Okay. So there's that. You got to submit it. Okay. Is that the copper? Is that going to work with copper as well? That was probably the one that you were doing. No. no, because the one that I had was the chromium, but that's this one is the one that I already got to myself out on. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a couple more. So, in that case, it's going to be the same case, right? The only thing is now you're taking away the electron. Okay, so remember when you're taking away from the electron, you want to go to the farthest shell out, right? So, in other words, your period, or the length of the period. Number that has the highest period. So in this case, this is the electron configuration right here. So in the case of AG plus, those are the same thing here. Oh, I was stuck on the puzzle. Okay, so here, where are you going to take that electron from? Remember, I gave you the analogy. Bond, right? So are you going to take it away from the kids that are closer to the mom or the one that is the furthest away? The one that's furthest. The one that's furthest, right? So in that case, which is it going to be? Is it going to be five? Or is it going to be the ten? So you're still waiting. This is that one. Okay. So 
I'll give you guys a couple more trials. Questions? Any other questions? I gave you guys two more trials. Okay, you guys ready? Pages in this packet, 
can I get another chapter one for next week for Essie? Yeah, you can. Please. Chapter 13. Yeah. Same thing, another one for uh, Demi? Yes. So this is an exception. 
right? So I knew I was going to lose any money here, right? <laughs> if you did, you fucked up somehow. That's a whole other story. Okay. So what it does in this situation is, is that the one who has the most electronegativity is going to get their opt. And then the other one's going to be screwed. They can't go over eight, but they can go under eight. Okay. Now, let me correct that a little bit. If they're in, if they're above group three, I mean, if they're above period three, they can't go over eight. So in other words, if you're in period two and you're in period one, you can't go over eight. Right? You always have to be below. Okay? So, or at eight. Okay? Yeah, at eight or below eight. So in this case, we have five valence electrons around our nitrogen. And then we have six valence electrons around our oxygen. So oxygen is going to make sure to get its own. Okay, so that's going to be the first thing. Okay. And then nitrogen is going to get as close to eight as it can. So that's two. That's four, that's six, that's seven around nitrogen. That's two, that's four, that's six, that's eight around oxygen. So the one that's the most electronegative is going to get theirs, and then the other guy is going to be short. Okay. Yes. I bet you're raising your hand. So these are exceptions. So this very first exception, it's called odd electron, right? Or we often will call it deficiency, okay? Because it's deficient, it doesn't have enough to get it, okay? Now, we also have some that will be, or we call it hypo, hypo -bale. Okay. Meaning that there's going to be enough for it to get to its eight. Or it just doesn't like to get to its eight. Let me type that on the board. This one here, when you have more than eight around you. So if you're in group three and below, you have the option of having more around. Now, usually you have to be forced to do this. So usually somebody that has a stronger electronegativity is bonding with you and they're forcing you to do this. Okay. And the reason that you're able to sit there and have more around you is because you can start putting stuff in your D orbital. Because technically, when you're in the third period, I mean, yeah, in the third period, you have access to the D shell because you have 3D. And so it'll start putting electrons in there to make it accommodate its partners. Okay, so in this case, we have uh, phosphorus, uh, penta, chloride, right? Okay, or sulfur, hexachloride. Okay, so those are two examples where they will actually put more. That eight electrons around them. Okay, they'll break the octet for it. And that's called hypervalence. Okay. Okay, so here are another examples of hypovalency. So beryllium, beryllium is technically a metal, but beryllium doesn't realize it's a metal. And so it forms covalent bonds with it. Okay, but 
when it forms Gauguin Laplace, it only likes to have four electrons around it. Boron is a metalloid. It's a special metalloid that, again, when it forms covalent bonds, will only have three, I mean, a total of six electrons, right? Three bonds, a total of six electrons. Okay, and this is another example of hypo valency. Okay, you guys have that look. So, what are the exceptions? Hypervalency, okay, me. All bonds, all the bonds. Go back. They have four or more electrons. They have more than eight electrons around them, right? Because octet, the eight around you is the magic rule, right? Having eight around you is the magic rule, right? So if you're hypervalency, you have more than eight around you. Okay, hypo means that you have less than eight around you, right? So I told you when we have an odd number, that's always gonna be a case of hypo vacancy. Hypo meaning under, right? And then our examples with beryllium and boron are two other examples of hypo vacancy. Okay. You guys got it? So this will be on the exam. Okay, so let's talk about nomenclature, right? You guys have been waiting for this since we did it for lab, right? Exciting. Okay, so typically in most cases, you're gonna have what we call binary molecular compounds, meaning binary meaning two. So it's usually broken down to two components, right? So you have two parts of the name, usually, right? Occasionally, I will throw something in there where you end up with more than that, okay? Now, the very first part of the name is going to be as is, right? The second part of the name is going to have I, if it's a, uh, if it's a, if it's not a polytonic I, okay? So, we're going to be talking about covalent, naming covalent compounds right now. Okay. So the way that we go about naming covalent compounds is, is that that very first part, we give it just the chemical element that we're working with, right? So for instance, if we have, let's do the ones that we did earlier, you know, right? So let's write this down. Do you mind if I drag this over here? Okay, so we're going to use Greek prefixes to tell us how many uh, of the element that we have. Greek prefixes. So if we have one, and we've talked about this already, one would be what? Mono on mono. One on one. Mono. Two. It's going to be di. Three, tri. Four, tetra. Five, tetra. Six, hexa. Hexa. Seven, hexa. Eight. Eight. Octum. Nine. Dona. Ten. Deca. Eleven. Moon Deca. Well, do, do deck, close to do deck. 13, 
All right, deck. Yeah, that is kind of interesting that we don't do the deck. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we're going to be using Greek prefixes to sit there and do only when we're talking about the covalent bonds and also when we're talking about the hydrogens. Okay, so you're going to use Greek prefixes, Greek prefixes for covalent bonds and hydrogens. Okay, so NO, I'm not saying no. What would be the name of NO? Well, we know that it's nitrogen and oxygen, but what would be its formal name? Okay, so when we do this, this is the case of full binary, right? The first one is nitrogen, right? So we just call it nitrogen, okay? And you use the prefix, the Greek prefix for mono only if it's on the second one. If it's just, if it's on the first one and it only has one, you don't use the Greek, pre the Greek prefix on it. You just use that name and it's understood to mean one nitrogen. So this guy would be called nitrogen monoxide. Now, the way oxygen works is oxygen will not put another vowel next to the O. It drops that vowel and then you just put it in there because you don't call it monoxide, you call it monoxide. You guys see that? So we're not writing it as monoxide. We're writing as monoxide. Okay. So if I have N O into O five. What would we name this guy? It would be nitrogen, but now we have to say that we have two, right? So it would be what? Di no di nitrogen. So you would just still be nitrogen, right? You only change the last part. The last name drops it. It's in, and it gets I. Okay. So then it would be di nitrogen. And then it's oxide or it's yeah. oxide? Pent oxide. Okay. Again, since there's an A, it's going to drop that A. And again, it's only oxygen that does this. Okay. It does, but except for dioxide. It doesn't do it for dioxide. That's the one that does do this. So if there's an I there, it won't do it. So try trioxide. It, it. it only does it for, so the I's it won't do it for, it does it for A's and O's. Okay. So. Our next one How many nitrogens do we have? Okay, so what is the Greek prefix for three, Jerry? It's 
Step on the book. Try. Try. So then it's try what? What is the name for the N? What is N stand for? Symbol N. Capital N. What does it stand for? On your periodic table. Capital N. Okay, so then it's tri nitrogen. And what? What is the symbol for seven? Hepta. And then it's I. What is I? Iodine. So in this case, instead of saying iodine, we say iodide, right? So it's hepta iodide. So we drop the I in and we put the I E. Okay. Ready for another? Okay. Let's do. H six P two. H six P two. Hey, Jerry. Now we have this one. Yeah, so right here, right? Excellent. Excellent. Hydrogen. Okay. Excellent hydrogen. So it's P2. Di. Di. Oxide. Fos. Fos. Di. Okay. So in this case, we're getting rid of the O R U S. We're dropping that. Now we're putting I D E. You say P, you ask us to. The element P. Yes. Then you say two. Which two. That means you need two of them, right? So what is the pre prefix for two? Pre prefix up there, two. Okay. So okay, you guys ready? One more? Yeah, one more. Okay. Let's do. Carbon. Carbon. So you'd write carbon. And then what? Nitrogen. Would it just be carbon nitrogen? How many nitrogens do we have? Three. Let's try. Okay. So we try nitrogen. Sorry. Try nitride. Okay. 
guys got it? So, great prefixes. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're given the name. Now you're going to give me the chemical formula. So we have dinitrogen pentasulfide. What would be the chemical formula? Base it. Di nitrogen. What does that mean? <coughs> what is the prefix? Di. What does that mean? Two. So that means I have how many nitrogens? There's two nitrogens. Correct. Okay, and then it says penta sulfide. What? Five of what? Yes. Okay. Okay, let's see. Alex. there? Yes. What about dinitrogen pentoxide? What would be the chemical formula? So you're saying um, you have two nitrogen, right? I have two nitrogens. Okay. So subscript two. And then you have uh, Five oxygen? Okay. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay, any volunteers for the next one? Or do I have to volatile? Um it's gonna be tetra iodine. Tetra. Iodide. Oh iodine. Correct. And then it's gonna be uh no, 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 oxide. No, oxide. No, oxide. No, oxide. That's correct. And the last one for gold. Genesis. Phosphorus. Pentafluoride. That is correct. How's your head feeling? Pretty good. <laughs> okay, so we've already talked about ions. You guys are already familiar with that. Cation, what charge? Positive. Positive. Anion is negative. negative. Okay. So when we add and remove electrons so that they're like the noble gases, we start to say that they're electro, uh, sorry, isoelectric with that noble gas. So for instance, all of these guys, if we add three electrons to nitrogen so that it's N3, it's gonna be uh, isoelectric to nitrogen. 
meaning that it has the same number of neon, uh, meaning it has the same number of electrons as neon. So that term iso meaning the same, electronic meaning the same number of electrons, okay? So if it's isoelectric to something, it has the same number as that other element, same number of electrons as that other element, okay? So oxygen, if we have O2, right? O2 minus, right? Forms its ion, so cool. So when we have that O2 minus, right? It is isoelectric to neon. It has the same number of electrons as neon. Neon has a total of 10 electrons. With us adding two more, it gives oxygen 10 electrons. Okay. Are you guys with me so far? Can you read it all the time? I said that if we add two more electrons to oxygen so that it's O2 minus, it's going to be just like neon, meaning it has to be the same number of electrons as neon. We have a total of 10 electrons. I always like to put something on isoelectronic on the team. Definition or an example. So here, when we remove electrons, so if we remove two electrons from magnesium, then it's also going to be isoelectronic to neon, right? Because look where magnesium is at on the periodic table. So if we remove two of those, it's going to be isoelectronic. Okay? How are you guys doing? Um, but does this have anything to do with the valence? Or is it just strictly like for... No, it, it does have to do with the valence, right? Because in the case of magnesium, how many valence electrons does, does magnesium have? Two? It has two valence electrons. So... It has the option of either trying to get six electrons, gain six electrons, which we know it's a metal, it's not gonna to wanna to do that, or to lose two valence, uh, lose two, those two valence electrons. Oh, I see. So it goes backwards into neon? That's right. And when uh -huh. it loses electrons, it becomes like neon. It's stable, it's isoelectronic to neon. So just that term, it basically means that you have the same number of electrons as the element that you're making reference to. Um, so you always compare it to um, the valence because in the case of nitrogen. Yeah. Um, when we said N3, right? N3 minus. Isn't that just like neon? Okay, I see. Yeah, that would be like neon. That's right. We have three more electrons that would be just like neon. So then it's isoelectronic to neon. And so the point is, is that it's stable because we know that the noble gases are stable. And by them trying to be like them, they become stable. So they form ions to be like those noble gases, where the noble gases are just themselves. Okay. This is just basically showing us that, right? What they have to do to be like the noble gas. Okay, so that brings us to ionic compounds. We're ready to go yet. We still have experiments to be done. Done yet. So, and we got 40 minutes left, right? Okay, so if we have uh, ionic bonds, ionic bonds are going to be held together by the ions. So you're always going to have a positive and a negative that's going to be holding it together. Now, when we think about it, how it's going to be held together, it's going to form what we call a crystal lattice. And so at room temperature and when they're by themselves, like, and not in solution, then they're going to be together. They're going to be um, held together. They're going to be very strong held together because of the charges. The charges are going to hold it together very strong. Okay, now when we put it in water, they're going to be able to conduct electricity. They're going to be great conductors of electricity. We're going to kind of talk about that, and I'm going to show you guys that in a second. Okay, 
So here's an example where we have sodium and chloride reacting together. So what's happening in that case is sodium is going to be getting rid of the electron, and then chloride is going to be accepting the electron because it wants the electron. Okay. So if sodium is getting rid of the electron, it's going to become positive. Positive. And then if chlorine is going to be getting an electron, it's going to become negative. And because they're positive and negative, they're going to form this lattice structure where the chlorine is going to be surrounded by the sodiums. And then sodiums are going to be surrounded by the chlorine. Okay, this is just showing you a better vision uh, view of the, the lattice. And so you guys can see it in a simple cube bottle, right? And this is what it does with the space field. Okay. This is just showing us that it conducts electricity when it's either melted, when it's in its liquid state, and you can actually melt salt, but you have to get it really, 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 really high. On our stove, we can't get it high enough. Okay. Um, or if we put it in solution with water, right? So salt separates, it's able to conduct electricity. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to actually stop here.